Hi, good afternoon. Today I have with me um, somebody who has had a, a big impression on my life. Uh, Rick Simpson from Way the Quest. First met him about, was it about six years ago at the uh, OSME conference, I think it was, at the BTO. Uh, since then I've been on the Board of Trustees with Way the Quest for a while. Unfortunately, about a year ago I came off that. But I'm still very much in touch with Rick and Elise and what they're doing with Wader Quest. It's an exceptional international charity, all run from a very small room in Newport Pagnell. So I'm delighted to welcome all the way from Newport Pagnell, Rick Simpson. Hi, Rick. Hello. Yes, Newport Pagnell, that well-known Wader capital of the world. That's why we're here, of course. Of course, surrounded by estuaries and beaches and just yes. prime way to habitat. Absolutely. I think I once saw a lapwing fly over. It's about the sum of it, really. But anyway, yes, I digress. Right. right. OK, so I, th I think to start off with, because you know how I feel about Wader Quest, it's, it's an unbelievable charity for what it does. Um, could you give us just a little bit of background as to, first of all, how Wader Quest became Wader Quest? Well, yeah, it was quite by accident, really. Um, I suppose it really started with uh, Spoonbilled Sandpiper um, because Elise and I were living in Brazil. We were coming back to live in, in England. And at that time, this is 2012, at that time it was becoming evident that there were problems with the Spoonbilled Sandpiper. I'd never seen one. And um, I'd also not seen a Slenderbilled Curlew and they'd managed to go extinct in my lifetime. It was I had the opportunity to see one, but didn't, um, didn't take that opportunity. So I, I was determined that above all else, I was going to see a Spoonie while I had the chance. Well, of course, that, in, you know, going to see a specific bird somewhere, um, you, you do as much study as possible. If you're a birdie, you, you really want to maximise your chances. The more I found out about the Spoonie, the more drastic I found out its situation was. And in the end, I think we came to a, a decision that rather than just go and see one, we should perhaps do something to try and prevent it becoming extinct. And there's not much ordinary people like us can do. So we just decided we would do some fantastical um, uh, event of some kind to try and raise some money. And that event turned out to be what we called at the time Wader Quest, um, which literally was just traveling to see as many waders as possible with the hope, with the view that people would um, buy into the idea, sponsor us, send us money. And in the end, we, we had a target of £3,000 and in the end, we, we just exceeded that. And all of that money, all of the money that was given to us, none of it went on expenses or anything like that. We paid for everything ourselves. All of that money uh, was sent to the um, World Farm Wetlands Trust for their Spoonbill Sandpiper captive breeding program, which was a, a novel idea at the time. So that's really how it started. In travelling around the world, we, we became personally au fait with a lot of the problems that all sorts of waders, common waders included, like our curly, um, were facing. And well, quite frankly, we said, well, we can't just leave it at that. We should do something. What are we going to do? So Wade of Quest metamorphosed from that into being a charity. And when was this? When did you actually set Way the Quest up? 2012. If we 2012. Yeah. Right. OK. And so you, you went looking for waders. Yeah. Uh, you came back with this inspirational idea and you set it up in 2012. But what is Way the Quest? So what? Because I just want people to understand what you actually do. What what does Wade Quest do? Because clearly you haven't got sort of release pens in your back garden that you breed black tail godwits in and then chuck them out into the wild in the hope that they're going to survive. So what actually does Wade Quest do? If only we did. Yeah. Um, well, uh, what the thing was that the, the, the realisation that we had was that all of this. Now, we, we've always loved waders. We've always enjoyed looking at waders and everywhere we go, we I personally concentrate on lapwings because they're, they're, they're my big thing. Um, but I, we had not really perceived the problems that were happening. And uh, we thought, well, if we're wader people, we like waders, we're involved with waders, 
how is it that we don't know this stuff? And if we don't know this, everybody else doesn't know it either. Well, not everyone else, clearly. But um, and we thought that that um, you know you you need we somebody needs to try and get more people involved, more people aware of this. And and we have two functions. One is to raise awareness, to let people know, to make them aware, because basically um, to make decision makers change things they have to have some pressure on them. And the only way they have pressure is public opinion. And if people don't know, they don't care. And if they don't care, they're not gonna ask anybody to change things. It's a brilliant mantra. Well, thank you. So, so that is that is why we put so much effort into trying to make people aware of things um, with talks and the website and, and blogs and all that sort of paraphernalia that goes with it. Um, and of course, attending events. Um, such as Bird Fair, which um, sadly is not going to happen in 2020. This we've just heard today, but all of those things are designed to make people understand that there's a problem. And of course, the other side of it is fundraising. So we will raise money in order to support people who are actively involved in wader conservation. Now, um, we we don't tend to give money to large organizations so we won't uh, sort, of, sort of support some of the well-funded organizations although i should say we just bought a uh, an incubator and gave it to the uh, wwt for their curlew um, head starting program what we like to do is to get the smaller local locally driven um projects um involved so that we you know we will support them the idea, of course, is that, that people take ownership of their birds and we've seen how this works and uh, we'll probably talk about some examples of that later. And so we will we will help fund these smaller projects around the world with a view to um, making a bigger difference to each project rather than just being sort of a, a, a drop in the ocean for some of the bigger projects. Yeah, yeah. So can you give me an idea of some of the projects that you've supported so far? Well, yes, I, I mean, it all started with the spoonbill sandpipe. So obviously we, we've got a vested interest in that. Um, so we're we're very happy to see that the head starting in, in Asia is working very well with um, head started birds. Head starting is where the eggs are taken, incubated and then returned to the wild as fully flying at uh, well, juveniles and 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 thus increasing the population in the short term. Some of those are returning and breeding for themselves, and and so that is going very well. The the the, the Slimbridge side of things, they've had a, a long learning curve, but finally they've now managed to, to to actually raise some young, so that's going well as well. So you know, it's great to be part of that and to follow all of that. The other thing that we picked up on quickly when we were travelling was hooded plovers. They were. Uh, only 5% of their, their, their birds were fledging, which is a course for extinction. You know, you just can't survive. A beach nesting bird is not going to survive that sort of um, loss of youngsters. And this is what this is. A, it actually, the, the hoodie is a fine example of exactly what we we think is the way forward for a lot of conservation. And that is that the Australians, uh, mainly headed by BirdLife Australia, encourage local people to take ownership of their local birds. They may only have one pair of hooded plovers on that beach, but they're their hooded plovers and those people wanted them to be there. Yeah. And so they yeah. went out of their way very cheaply, very easily, putting up signs, putting up fences, talking to people. And it hasn't had an amazing effect. And we feel that we should be supporting this sort of operation, particularly even on a smaller scale where it's just local people involved rather than a big national entity uh, and and you know the, the big organizations can do the political stuff the big stuff but they can't protect every nest but somebody can and those people are the people we want to support just to pick up on something you said about the um breeding success or rather lack of it of the uh, hooded plovers what was it that was driving that what why was the success rate so low? Well, two things, predation and disturbance. Predation 
um, is always a problem for ground nesting birds. And there are plenty of natural he um, predators such as peregrine falcons, um, you know, where we are, you know, foxes are natural and that sort of thing. There are, there are plenty of predators, but nature has a way of, of having a sufficient numbers of things so that predators don't dent the population. Where the hooded plover was concerned, for example, they didn't just have the native um, predators causing them problems. They have foxes, stoats, weasels, cats, dogs, goats, you name it, any, you know, all sorts of other things that were introduced, causing additional pressure on them. At the yeah. same time, there was disturbance because where is it that hooded plovers breed? Sandy beaches. Where did Australians spend most of their life? On the beach probably a bit of stereotyping there but I mean, let's face it the beach is very very important to Australian people and therefore there was a conflict of, of people against wildlife and wildlife always comes off second best um, and, and so this combination of things meant that, that there were a smaller or a fewer number of um, there were fewer nesting pairs and then, of course, predation, natural or otherwise, has a bigger significant effect because the, there isn't the population to sustain the attrition that they are suffering. However, all of this is what I really need to say about this is it's been very successful. This, it, the success rate is now over 50 percent in Australia where they are protecting them. And just the other day, uh, I got a report from uh, Adelaide that they, they had a, they had 17 fledged chicks and it's the best for a decade so it's working this 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 idea that local people looking after their local birds is working and and long may it continue we you know we, we're encouraging this in many places around the world venezuela brazil we've, we've sent stuff to azerbaijan would you believe nepal malaysia indonesia lots of places where just local people um taking care of their local environment is what's counting yeah yeah and it's it's great that you pick up on the hooded plover as the project and the fact that they're doing so successful if you remember rightly and you might not because i'm aware of your age <laughs> <laughs> but if you remember rightly when i first met you uh, one of the postcards i bought off you was a hooded plover uh, it was a, a photograph taken by your wife an excellent photographer elise um, you'd made it into a postcard and it was a postcard that actually when I worked at the BTO I actually had stuck on my desk because it's a bird I've never seen. Uh, it's a bird that really captured my imagination and I will put a, a picture up of it on the website and clearly people can come to your website and see it. It's a stunning bird. There's something about sort of black and red and white together that maybe it's the Man United colours. I didn't mention that. Um, awesome bird. I'm so glad it's doing well. Um, now, you, you mentioned a few other countries just in passing there. Can, can you give us just a potted overview of some of the other projects that you've done and what type of species we're talking about? Well, the, the emphasis isn't necessarily on species. It's, it's more on the community that's involved. But, for example, in, in Venezuela um, and in Brazil particularly, there, there were people who it, it, again, it wasn't the species, it was the fact that there were a large number of North American migrants. I say North American, and they spend more time away from North America, of course, but um, the, 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 the Arctic breeding migrants, large numbers of them, you know, what we would consider to be probably quite common, although the semi palmated sandpiper is not doing terribly well, I believe it's now near threatened. And, and it was just the, the idea that these people would see the value of the wetlands and certainly the mudflats, because generally people look at mudflats and say, well, we can turn that into a car park. It looks like one already. They don't think of it as being as vibrant as a rainforest. Nobody looks at a rainforest and thinks, well, that, yeah, that would make a good car park. Some people do, I admit. But mudflats tend to, to, to just be thought of as a, a mucky wasteland and they're not. They're very, very important places. So a lot of these projects that we've mentioned, um, again, Malaysia and Indonesia, as well as Venezuela and Brazil, for example, those projects are based on people being informed about what is going on out there on the mud and how important it is to them and why they should be proud of it and want to preserve it. And that, again, is key to what we do. 
but we have supported people in, in Peru, for example. We we bought um, mist nets for them to do um, scientific study. Um, we've we've helped people in various places with rings and, and, and equipment of that sort, because um, it is also important to remember that that conservation cannot happen without science. You know, it, take the analogy of a doctor. You walk into a doctor's surgery, he says, oh, hello, um, here's some pills, off you go. He hasn't asked what's the matter with you. He hasn't found out what's wrong with you. He doesn't know how to cure you. And it's exactly the same with conservation. You have to find out what the problem is, then think about how to deal with it and then deal with it. And so that process has to happen. So without science, conservation is is well, it's, it's not going to happen. So yeah. that, that's really important to us. And, uh, you know, it, it, with the guys in Nepal, for example, they were studying the, the woods. Yes, the wood snipe. And I mean, <laughs> I've never seen one of those. And I don't expect I ever will. But they, they found this this breeding ground. And lo and behold, the some of the local people are beginning to put a lot of livestock in there. The livestock themselves are not necessarily a problem. It's the quantity. And that is what may be a problem for what is already a very scarce bird. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, it seems to be sort of commonplace around the world. And, and it, it was interesting that you mentioned earlier on the, the uh, I nearly said curly sandpiper, you know, I always get them too mixed up. I don't know why. It's just a name in my little brain, but the spoonbill sandpiper. Um, and, you know, what actually happened at sort of Samangam, which for those that don't know, is a, a dam in South Korea uh, that was basically was a mud flat and they, they dammed it and that had a significant impact in the likes of the, the spoonie and it was it Newman's green shank, Newman's oh. green shank. Norman, yeah, but particularly the great knot was the bird. That yeah, started. great knots, bical teal. You know, this has a massive impact, and it, you know, it's great that you know. Hopefully, people will start looking at mudflats now after this interview and go, yeah, actually, you know, that that's a habitat. You know, it's it's not a piece of mud; it's a habitat. So you know, that's that's really sort of relevant. Um, what I want to move on to now is sort of. This thing about inspiration of waders. Hmm. Before well, we just talk about your book, which just happens to be called an inspiration of waders. I, I love inspiration of waders. Just for those of you, because there'll be a lot of you out there that are going, what is this old guy dithering on about now? Inspiration of waders is, I am right, is inspired, yeah, is Rick's term for the equivalent to a murmuration of starlings. And it just works for me. It just works. Where? Where did it come from? Why? Why and where? And because I know it certainly became. It's almost chicken and egg. Which came first, the the phrase or the book? Ah well, ah. <clears throat> they they may well have come come. They may be twins. Well, it struck me that um, when I was watching uh, Snettisham, this incredible incredible display of, of life that you see when the birds are flying around and changing shapes and all the rest of it and and it occurred to me that there wasn't a collective noun for this I, I heard people saying you know it's a murmuration but you know murmuration is specific really to starlings and a lot of waders have their own collective nouns you know a pack of knots a deceit terrible word of lapwings curfew of curlews Lots of a non of Godwits will tell me where that came from. Um, but anyway, they, they all have them. But they these are this is a mixed flock or an unidentified flock. So we don't know what they are. So we can't apply any of those. And and I I, I said to myself at the time, this is you know, this is absolutely awesome. And an, an awesomeness of waders just didn't, you know, didn't fit. Another interest of mine, other than the pure conservation and and watching waders and, and, and learning about waders is is the history of things and, and a lot of um, things that are connected with waders, things that have been inspired by waders and you'll be surprised at some of them. Um, so those those things all began to gel as an idea and basically 
um, when when we ended up putting the book together, it was this collection of ideas of how waders have inspired us. And this collective noun came from the foot. Well, you know, they are inspiring. So this, you know, it's it's no less appropriate than omniscience of Godwitz, let's be honest. And so what we hoped was that, that people would pick up on this and start using it because waders really are very, very inspiring birds. Yeah, and I'm with you on that. I'm sold. I, I think it's uh, definitely the right phrase. So on to an inspiration of waders, your book. Um, <laughs> obviously got it, obviously read it twice. So don't ask me to recite anything out of it because you know what my memory is like. Um, just to put it into context, what's the book about? Because I know you've sort of alluded it to yourself. You're, you're about more than sort of conservation, the waders conservation, the love of waders. I think that love extends further into, you know, how they fit in sort of mythology, how they fit into sort of, you know, various different aspects of life. And I have to just come across in the book. So can you just give us a bit of context about that book before we move on to what I have to say, I have read only once. I find it a much more exciting book, but for a different reason. So we'll come on to that. So let's just put uh, an inspiration of ways into context first. Right. Well, OK, thanks. The um... At this point, holding it up so people can see it would be quite good because yeah. I have left my copy upstairs. I don't know if you can see that okay. But, I mean, yeah. I mean, if ever, if ever a, a picture and a title went together, that's one. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so the book is a collection of reasons why I believe that these birds are inspiring. It starts with, uh, I, I'm not going to spend hours on this, obviously, but it starts with a, a chapter on what how I became inspired by waders, and that was through the lapwing, which is why it's my favourite bird, still is, always will be. It's there's a there's a chapter about how other people have been inspired, people who are well known um, waderologists, if you will, um, and how they why did they become wader? Why waders? Why not raptors or woodpeckers? There are reasons for these things that they, they were inspired by them. At some point, something sparked that need to help them. But there's did it's you just make that word up? Is waderologist actually a word? It, it's it's a it's a made up word, but not by me. <laughs> Stolen it from somewhere. I, I, among we waderologists, we we bandy it about a bit. Wader oh, right. and you know, but waderology yeah. is is kind of a word now. It's a bit like discombobulated and and a lot of other things that have come into <laughs> use these days. But um, uh, yes, was it? Oh yes. So the, yeah, the the next chapter after that is um, getting away from. Um, you know the, the the real life thing so waders have inspired us in music literature poetry myths and legends or then the following chapters sort of cover all that sort of thing coming up with reason or, 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 or explanations as to how um, or indeed in, in some cases like art classic art they're, they're very 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 rarely um appear and there's kind of an explanation for that too but that so having covered all of that sort of stuff we also then went into the kind of things that have been inspired by them for example the guinness book of records or book of world records for example that came about because of an incident with a golden plover in order to find out what it is you probably will need to buy the book i think i'm supposed to say that at this juncture um partly because we haven't got all day to sit here listening to me waffle on about the stuff that you can find elsewhere anyway but you know there's a there's a lot of things like that in it um various stories there's even one about uh, george w bush there you go that's how exciting this book is if there was ever a reason to buy your book exactly. you just hit it right on the head well i gotta tell you he doesn't come out very well in that particular story so even more reason <laughs> to buy your book <laughs> so so moving on slightly yes. um, to Yuri. Yuri, oh yes. Brilliant idea. Love the idea. You're going to show us the book in a sec. Um, 
just tell us a little bit about the book. You better do because I know at least made sure you had one available. So yeah, you show us the book and and just give us a little bit of a, an overview of that and also the project that you have been involved in in, in sort of the Far East with that book. Okay, well Yuri, um, I I don't know what spurred it on to happen. I couldn't tell you what the spark was, but I suddenly found myself writing a children's book for six to eleven year olds. The idea, of course, being that you can't get them early enough. If you can get people interested and worried about conservation and wildlife when they're kids, then hopefully you've got a whole lifetime of conservationist there. So that was the, you know, the, the purpose behind it. Although, again, I'm not sure what the inspiration was other than the way to themselves. The book basically talks about Yuri. Um, and I'll explain the name in a moment because it is a bit bizarre. Um, he was he starts in the egg you can he can hear sounds outside he breaks out of the egg he he goes through all the trials and tribulations he's one of four chicks which is fairly normal um he flies south only three of them get to fly south he flies south only two of them actually manage to get to the south uh, we talk about um, don't some put of the, the whole plot away here you know people oh, okay. want to read this yeah <laughs> it up you know um, and then then all the trials and tribulations that they they suffer as waders and and you know so it applies equally to, to a lot of other species not just the spoonbill sandpiper but you know the the spoonie has become iconic and and a sort of a symbol to 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 cover all if you were if you will and then he goes back again and he you know the, the story is then that it finishes with him having his own uh, particular nest having met up with another spoonie along the way so it, it is it is a it is a quite a it's a children's book but it doesn't pull punches you know birds do disappear off the face of the earth they yeah. do have problems but i i think if you you can't you can't um candy wrap this you have to make it real so that even small children realize that that um life's tough if you're a long distance migrant and particularly if you're only that big that's that's the, the meaning behind it. i should I, I said i was going to explain the the name I'll, I'll show you a copy of the book if you can see that okay can you see yeah, that yeah. that's perfect so, yuri is um a corruption of, of yuri norinkus which was the scientific genus for this species which has now been changed to clidris Unfortunately, this happened after I've written the book, but I wouldn't want to call him Cali because that sounds like something from Mexico anyway. And of course, Yuri, it's a corruption again. Yuri is a Russian name. They breed in Russia. So hence, I thought I was being very clever by combining the two. Um, that is why the poor bird has a particularly strange name. His, you know, his, his, his um, siblings all have classic um uh, uh, spanish name. spanish what am i talking about they have classic uh, um russian names so you know that, that's just to explain that side of it right now the the far east thing that i alluded to china or somewhere well it's been um it's been translated hasn't it for use in schools uh, here's one i have uh, look at that that's yuri the spoonbill sandpiper in chinese i hope I have no idea if it is or not, of course, but I hope it is, um, of course. Um, yes, as we as we developed the, the idea, we didn't um, we didn't really know where it came from, but we thought that if we created this thing, we could then have it translated into the languages of the countries that live along the flyway of the spoonbill sandpiper, in order that those children would be able to um, benefit from reading the story themselves so they didn't have to learn English first. We didn't see you know, the, the, on none of none of these books do Elise and I make any money. They all the all the money goes into Way to Quest. They're the, you know they're, they're done for Way to Quest by Way to Quest if you will. So there's no profit in it for us anyway. So we thought well if we can persuade local um, the local countries someone to get involved to take it on to translate it to produce it um that would be fantastic and the first of those to grab this opportunity was china a lovely lady called jing li over there uh she she um took the book she had it translated 
with her friends and they found someone who would produce it. They produced, I think, 2000 copies. Yes, 2000 copies, which are I don't know how advanced this is, but a few months ago um, before all this um, virus business put things on hold, they'd been they, they were doing workshops with children using URI as the textbook, if you like. So yeah. it's, it was getting to 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 about 2000 copies in China of the story of the spoon build sandpiper going to children and uh, to be honest, we, we were both delighted and, dare I say, proud that this has happened. Was, you know, it was an idea and it's actually happened. If other countries want to take it on, uh, Cambodia, Thailand, South Korea, North Korea even, let's be ambitious. Why not? All these countries that, you know, where, where they occur, it would be fantastic to think that we could we could reach more children that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. And, and I think a good point to leave it at, apart from one more thing that I think that we should mention before we go, and that is, I know you've got a great board of trustees because I used to work and have met a lot of them. Um, just a quick shout out for Elise. Um, she's had a lot to put up with. Uh, well. uh, <laughs> now, you know, you, you and Elise do a great job. You're sort of, you're, it's a great partnership. Um, at least take some great photographs. People can see them on the website and, you know, does put a lot of work into this. A bit camera shy otherwise I'd have had her on here today talking with you and slowing you down a little bit. No, I'm joking. Right. So, yeah. So thanks, Rick. That was really good. Um, I'm, we'll have to follow up at some stage. There's, there's bound to be other projects that we uh, would like to talk about. Um, certainly, I know you've got another book on the back burner, so we'll we'll have to sort of see what happens now, because I know you're going to launch it at Bird Fair and that's no longer happening. Um, but if you decide that you are going to launch it anyway in the future, let's have a chat about that. And, um, you know, certainly let's keep talking about waders. OK, well, it's been a great pleasure, great fun. Thank you very much. Of course and it has. <laughs> thank you for mentioning Elise, because I, I would have done anyway. It was always at the end of all my talks, I come up with this thing. There's one more bird I want to talk about. And then I show a picture of Elise. They all fall about laughing. And I, I like to point, I do like to point out that this is not all about Rick Simpson. This is about Elise and Rick. In fact, the many more people involved now. It isn't about us. I want to try and get away from that personality thing. Wader Quest is an entity and, it, and it's, a, it's a great thing. But we won't want to uh, belittle the, the effort that Elise puts into doing the things that I can't do, which involves all this paraphernalia around me, all the, the, the gadgets and so on. I can't do all that. I'm just sitting here doing as I'm told. Um, so yeah, it, it's uh, it, it is important that you did that, and thank you for that. You're welcome, and thanks again for your time. And I'll speak to you very soon. Looking forward to it already, Alan. Bye for now. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Bye. Bye.